everyone. Welcome back to the Travel Mug Podcast. We are so excited this week to be joined by Kat, who runs an amazing Airbnb here in Nova Scotia called Moon and Roses Chalet. Welcome, Kat. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you. Um, this is, you're welcome. This is so we wanted to invite you on the show. You know, we know you've traveled a lot yourself. You've worked in different spots, including the hostel scene and not hostile, hostels. And now you are back home in Nova Scotia for now and you run your family Airbnb. So we thought it would be interesting for us to let our listeners sort of learn what it's like to actually run a vacation spot. It can't be easy and sort of all that goes into that. But first and foremost, and Jen and I were talking about this before the recording because we read a little bit of what you wrote and we're both like, we're chickens because (laughs) this is amazing. (laughs) We're like, we're both just chickens. So we want us to sort of like you to walk us through first and foremost, like tell us some about where you've traveled because it's incredibly interesting. Oh, wow. Thank you. That's that's a huge compliment. One thing I find about traveling is sometimes you get so humbled by what other people have done. And other times you're like, wow, like I have done a lot or (laughs) I got to experience a lot more than some people get to. And it's it's, um, traveling's humbling, I think, at the end of the day. And uh, yeah, but it's thank you for that compliment, because I've got friends where I'm like, gosh, I've done nothing, or I'm a scaredy cat. (laughs) So yeah, it's just, it's all what you're comfortable with and and that and taking opportunities and making opportunities. And I've been really fortunate to, to be able to do it. I've, I've also worked, you know, I think some of my friends think I just travel. (laughs) They never ask me like, where are you traveling to? I've been working (laughs) for years, (laughs) like, you know, and in that but anyway so I've I I I was really when I was 18 I was really fortunate to with my best one of my best friends their family had always had exchange students and when I was 18 just sort of high school I actually I have a I grew up on a family farm and I was able to take August off, which was a big deal. <laughs> and uh, I got to go with my best friend to France to visit the exchange student that had been with their family a few years before. So I actually was uh, pretty young when I first left. And my thinking back, my parents were pretty cool. So let me do yeah. that. And we, we road tripped around France. We were 18, 19 and 20, the three of us. And oh it was just so fantastic and freeing and I I was and then you know university and working came in there and but I worked through university and I saved for a few years and then I kind of was like I'll take August off (laughs) um, (laughs) and for a few summers I sort of did the European circuit thing I did a few like tours I don't know if you've ever heard of Kentucky yep but I did some Kentucky travel tours because I was like oh I can hit up things and see things and I, you know I would I would never do that again but at the time it was perfect and I got to meet so many amazing people there were a lot of Australians I, Australians have a very dear spot in my heart and what I think like talking about traveling and growth into it is like I, on these things, like, sure, you're on a bus and you're going from place to place and they're telling you where you sleep and you kind of figure out where you're eating with your pals, but there was so much free time. Mm -hmm. And I also learned a lot about myself on that. It's like, I like the group atmosphere and having people hang out within the day, but I really loved going off on my own and exploring. And that taught me to how to use subways because, I mean, we don't have those in Nova Scotia. and, and all that. So it, it really built up my travel confidence of navigating. And I always think back to, I was in Greece, I was in Athens. I was like, oh, I got the full day before I have to be anywhere, meet anybody. <laughs> and I, I, I had, I ripped out the map from my lonely planet and <laughs> set out in Athens. <laughs> and then I was walking down and I was like, looking at the map, looking at the street signs. And it's like, the street signs are all in Greek. And my map is in English. So I really just like ripped up the map <laughs> and just let my, my um, sense of direction guide me. So I've done some traditional European stuff and going around. I've also been to Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia, the Baltics up there. 
-hmm. That was really exciting. Yeah. So I traveled there on my own, but I joined a backpacking group just because the language was, I, I was never going to learn three, three <laughs> languages like that. And then I've, after that, I felt I kind of needed a little more challenge. So on my 25th birthday, I landed in Bogota, Colombia, and uh, <laughs> I hiked around there. Did you go to Columbia by yourself? No, I actually went with, I met up with a guy I was dating at the time. Yeah. Gotcha. He, he, he was Australian. Um, but, Those Australians. Yeah, yeah. I know, I know. <laughs> and so, yeah, we traveled around backpacking, just using local transport the whole time in Colombia and doing some pretty awesome hikes. And then the next year, I was like, I need to do something better. So I went to Morocco. <laughs> and um, <laughs> that, was, that was really great. <laughs> it, was, it was a really good kind of cultural, not shock, but just like to really shake it up that way. Yeah. And it, it was lovely, lovely. And then the people you meet along the way are just, they make the trip too, right? I've been to Brazil a couple times. I've had friends of the family that were living and working there. So I got to travel down there, stay with them, but then I was kind of on my own, so to speak, but kind of had that base to go back to. Right. Um, where else? Don't leave out Spain. 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 You need to talk about Spain. Spain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I've, I've walked to Caminos. So do you guys know what the Caminos are? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 So I've, I've walked through Caminos, I've walked, um, not the traditional one that most people see in the movie, The Way, on the Camino de Frances. I've walked uh, the Camino Primitivo, which is a little shorter. It's 400 and more through the mountains. And I've done the Camino del Norte. So from the border with France in the north of Spain and through the Basque country, all the way down to Santiago. Oh, wow. Yeah. Have you done a Camino? You're you're looking like you have, Jen. No, it's, it's on my bucket list for sure. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which one? I don't know. Like, I just, I love the idea of it. I love the idea of like all of that walking and we're going to Scotland and yeah. my best friend's parents are going with us as well. And they've done like a walk from Glasgow up to Fort William as well. And I'm like, that's just okay. so cool. Like, I just can't, I can't imagine oh. like how it is walking yeah. every day. Yeah. Oh my gosh. If you want to meet some great people, if you're in Inverness, a really lovely couple, great, great friends of mine, Jamie and Sarah, they're, they're there. They, oh, they take in. Oh, they're really <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. One day in Inverness. Yeah. We'll exchange it after because yeah. 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 Um, and uh, we should meet up for a coffee if you ever want to chat Caminos because yeah. it's, it's, it's life changing in a way. And it, I, the Camino, they say like, it sounds hokey, but like the Camino gives you what you need, not what you want. And it's so true. And there's just so much of life you can take out of it. And yeah, I recommend it. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I've done two Caminos. That's so poetic. <laughs> I, I don't know if I can really take credit for that word by word, but, but yeah, I've just, that, that was really an awesome on both occasions and they were back to back, but at very different times in my life as well. I was going through a pretty big change up um, with the second one. And if, funny enough, the second Camino just kind of felt like a safe place for me to go to kind of bridge the gap between <laughs> leaving life as I knew it and, and starting something new. Yeah, and I've also been to Reunion Island and I lived in the Panhandle, so in northern, northwestern Florida for quite a few years. Oh, cool. And I road tripped. That allowed me to road trip around the, the southeast of the states quite right. a bit. Right. And then I also done a big sort of Route 66 trip, more focused on the, the southwestern part of the states and that. So, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, so, so, that's what it <laughs> so that is a ton. So I know this question is going to be difficult. So if you could narrow it down, what would you say is your favorite destination? I know that's going to be so hard, but what would you say? Spain's very near and dear to my heart. I, I would probably say Reunion Island right now. It's just it's such a paradise and you don't think paradise can exist, but it does. And it kind of 
suits everything you need like for me as my travel style. So right. I, I love swimming and I love the beach, but I'm not a beach bum, but you've got that. Uh, you just have to watch out for sharks, but then you've got all the hiking and the tropical rainforest and mountains. So it's really just a great blend of everything. And the island's so tiny. It's, I think it's 60 by 45 kilometers. So right. like you could probably fit it in kind of like the Cabot Trail region <laughs> or like right. from Waikagama up to Meet Cove of Cape Breton, just right. to put it into perspective. And I spent a month there and, uh, I could, I didn't even get everything off the bucket list. So oh, wow. yeah. yeah. And there's, oh yeah, that was just a really amazing trip. Yeah. Awesome. It's also the furthest I was ever from home too. So that's kind of neat. Is that off the coast of Africa? It is. It's off, it's a little island owned by France and it's off Madagascar. Okay. So, that's what I thought. Uh, awesome. Yeah. Mar Mauritius is uh, a little bit more well-known, but Reunion Island's there. So yeah. yeah and I, I think really one of my dad's friends have act has actually gone there. He's a fish broker. And I think he okay. had actually, yeah. And I think he had traveled to Reunion Island, which is the only reason I knew anything about it, but it sounds amazing. Sounds amazing. Yeah. You, I think you guys would, I think everyone would love it. And <laughs> it's, you know, if you speak a little French, you get by. I was kind of a few months off of Spain where I really worked hard at my Spanish like the year before going and I was really confusing the locals because <laughs> they'd, be like, they'd be like where are you from and I'd be like I'd start speaking in Spanish and then have to switch and they'd be like what why you're from Canada why are you speaking Spanish <laughs> and I'd be like I am who I am yeah <laughs> Yeah, oh, that's so, so funny. It, it was just a paradise, and yeah, and I got to see a volcano erupt, and it was just oh. completely off, not planned, not planned at all. Piton de Frenesi had been erupting a couple weeks before I was going, but not when I was landed. And then, so I had a friend, actually the exchange student that my friend and I went to go visit in France, he and I stayed really good friends over the years. And he's, he was living and working there. And he said, like, come down. It's so amazing. And it was his second time living there actually. And because he's an adrenaline junkie, man, like <laughs> he's one of those people that makes me feel like I haven't done anything. Right. Um, <laughs> and he, uh, so since it was the second time living in the island within 10 years, he's like, I'm not going to get a house. I'm going to convert a van. Of course he was. <laughs> and he, yeah, he converted a, like a FedEx little delivery MBW van into a home. <laughs> so it, it was just like the perfect travel because I also got to like live up my dream of living in a van. <laughs> and, but I also had my own time because then when he had to go to work, I had to right. be on my own and then we'd meet up and like I got to do my own thing as a solo traveler but then had that local influence yeah. there and the in those and yeah just some cool stuff you never would have found on your own. So we're talking about like you know you traveling solo what's it like to be like a female solo traveler because Megan and I have not done it. <laughs> No. Okay, I was I was curious if you guys had or not. No. no. Um, well, I think it's really beautiful to travel as a woman. Yeah. I've never traveled as a man, so I don't know. <laughs> but um, I, fair point. <laughs> maybe one day I could go incognito. Yeah. But, no. Um, no. <laughs> but I, I think traveling as a woman is actually a really beautiful experience you know I think off the cuff everyone thinks like oh you're going to be so vulnerable out there and stuff but at the end of the day we're all human there's more openness I think when you travel solo as a woman so say I've been traveling with a friend who's a male or a significant other I, I find people just they kind of gravitate to you a little more. It's like, they want to make sure you're okay. They want to make sure you're not lonely. Yeah. And it really opens the door to getting to know more local people or just having a chat. And then that leads to something else. As, as you guys know, whether you're traveling with someone or not, just how the randomness of, of traveling right. can, yeah. can happen. So yeah, yeah and like <laughs> I used to get into 
on the second Camino in the north, especially through the Basque country. Yeah, the abuelas, the little grandmothers would <laughs> be hanging out their laundry and, you know, you'd be walking through their backyard, basically. Yeah. Um, and these small, small, small rural towns, like, like Megan knows where I live and that's pretty rural, but like this is, <laughs> it's pretty much the same, um, but <laughs> a little more rural. And uh, they're, they're always like, to a solo, like you're solo, like you're alone. Are you okay? You need a strong Spanish man. And so, <laughs> you know, you could just say, like, oh, you know, as your Spanish approach, you'd be like, well, do you, I'm single. Do you have a grandson? Yeah. Like, <laughs> Absolutely. Because uh, by the time you call him, I'll only be 5K down the road. You just a lot of this, like this little cute banter. And they were so curious about why you were traveling alone. And or just sometimes like when I, if I'm out alone, I go to dinner mm -hmm. or have to eat, but I'll often take my journal and, and write about the day or what I'm thinking or feeling or do some planning. And I just find people start chatting and you can just find out so much about people and spaces and what to see and do and, and that and love it. Or, or you end up at like these cool underground poetry readings in Barcelona because <laughs> they're they're poets and they're reading later that night and, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you never know where it's going to take you some random random things so I think and I, I I think you describe it perfectly and I I can only imagine that it at times it must be a really beautiful experience is there advice well, in particular sorry. though or that you would mm -hmm. give someone who maybe is a little timid to do it or has reservations, like what would, if you could give a major piece of advice, what would that be to, to a female who's maybe looking to get out there or anybody really who wants to travel solo? I guess the one big thing takeaway and that would be always trust your spidey senses. Mm -hmm. And like I said, that goes for everybody. So you know, the more you're out there and trying new things or in different places, you know, you do have to, you're not always in Nova Scotia, right? So you do, if you, if you trust your sense and your gut and your heart's not telling you something's right, or on the opposite, if ever, if it is telling you like it's right, go for it. Yeah. Um, yeah, just trust your gut instincts. And I've been really fortunate traveling as a woman, but I don't think that's just on luck. I think it's also feeling eh, something's not right here I'm gonna right. I'm gonna check it out and yeah. and you know it's yeah I mean I can go into more detail if you want where it's not explicit but one time uh, near the end of the Camino del Norte and there was this town that just had this weird energy <laughs> and I kind of like popped out of the woods and you're walking on this high what like secondary road mm -hmm. into this town and there's actually this stunning sunset and a field of sunflowers and like that was great but then this car like went by and stopped and backed up way behind me and then backed up again and like right away I was like that's mm. not right no. so people would often stop and just say like whether you were male or female like oh do you need water do you have a place to stay do you need something just sort of camaraderie especially these towns along the Camino because they they know people need support sometimes right right but you know the guy rolled down his window <laughs> like he barely fit in his little car and it's just he was like, he asked me, so on the Camino, you collect stamps where you stay and it's kind of a little memento in this Camino passport you have right. at the end. And he asked me in Spanish, like, do you want a stamp? And I was like, no, oh. I don't need a stamp. And he's like, then he started asking me like, am I alone? And where was I going? And, and all that. And I, 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 I don't lie. I never lie, but I lied then. And I said like, Oh, my boyfriend's in the woods. And then he's like, <laughs> like, thank goodness. I knew a bit of the language. Right. Yeah. And he's like, why is he in the woods and not with you? He should be with you. And it was just like, I not actually told him. Yeah, I, I know. <laughs> I made him drive off because I told him my boyfriend's in the woods taking a poop. <laughs> so I, was walking ahead. <laughs> I didn't have a boyfriend in the woods, but he drove off. Pooping, but I mean, so, whatever. I guess, I guess, yeah, yeah, I got rid of a, got rid of the creeper. But like tip number two, know a little bit of the local language. It can get you out of a jam. 
<laughs> like you'll also meet a lot of great people, but it'll get you out of the jam. Yeah. And then things just continued to get weirder <laughs> as I got to town. And it was like sun getting to be sunset. So I had to stay there. And uh, I checked into this pension like albergue and but there was no one else there and the woman was very friendly and nice but then she started to ask and but it was unlike a Spanish grandmother she was like are you alone do you want to be alone like things like this yeah. and I was like yeah I'm just tired I just want to go and have some dinner where do you recommend and she's like oh you have to go to this bar da, da, da. so like I went to this bar because I think there was only two places you could have dinner right, <laughs> right. and you know when you walk like 20 30k you're pretty hungry yeah so I, I went in I think I was having a burger and a beer and there was no one else there it was a female bartender and then the phone rang and the bartender picked it up and she was like uh-huh and she kind of like did the side eye like uh -huh. yeah yeah she's here she's here okay okay hung up the phone yeah so again no little of the language yeah and then all of a sudden every tom dick and harry started to show up at the bar oh my gosh <laughs> i know you probably think i'm making this up but it's like well Ooh, you don't lie maybe, 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 maybe <laughs> for that one maybe eight yeah, it's like maybe eight o'clock is the local happy hour. I don't know. And then, <laughs> and then like everyone came over, started asking me if I wanted a drink. And the bartender started putting like free drinks in front of me. And I just, I didn't even finish my meal, <laughs> but I didn't want to be I rude. Oh. And then one guy comes over and he's like, oh, won't you have a drink? It's my birthday and I'll be so upset. And I was just like, please, cumpleaños. And da, 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 da. <laughs> And uh, just to like save face, I like paid for my meal and I told the bartender, like, here's an extra, like a little bit by the birthday guy a drink. And I, I, oh, I'm that's way hungry. nicer than you. <laughs> that's so much nicer than you needed to be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've also got to like, you know, you don't want to piss off the locals. Sure, I know. That's so, also a good point. That should be tip number three. Yeah. Don't tip <laughs> off the they, they Don't piss off, piss off the, the locals. <laughs> but, you know, it's like they like they probably know where I'm sleeping because they knew where I was eating. <laughs> like, right. So I yeah, I just and I was still hungry. And luckily there was this little corner store open. I remember like buying a bunch of Kit Kats and taking them back <laughs> to my room. I had to leave my burger. So I needed to get oh. some chocolate bars. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Protein carbs. Yeah. But you know, it was one of those, and I'm, I'm not too paranoid traveling, but again, like I remember like I barricaded my door that day. It was just a little weird. The whole town was yeah. a little weird. That's and so then, <laughs> I would yeah, been yeah. Been. But like, again, it was that spidey sense of just like something's weird and it was just all accumulated to being uber weird. Yeah, and, right. But the funny thing is, just so you know, I'm not crazy, <laughs> is I, the next day in the next town, I met up with some travelers that I knew yeah. and um, that I'd run into on the Camino, like over multiple days, over multiple yeah. weeks. And they were like, where did you stay last night? Like, where are you? I was like, oh, I stayed in this Formido. And they're like, oh man, we walked through there and that place was just weird. And I was like, <laughs> let me tell you a story. <laughs> you don't know anything. Listen to that. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, yeah, you walked through there at two in the afternoon and thought it was weird. Yeah. <laughs> you should have saw it after sunset. Oh. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Those sunflowers were deceiving. <laughs> oh, indeed. That's so funny. But yeah, so I, I think I think Always that I love that you kind of said before that you started with like a bus tour type situation mm -hmm. and kind of like built yourself up into doing these like solo trips where you were truly solo and kind of planning your own because I think that's a good way for people to get out there and try like solo travel where you're not really on your own but you're on your own and outside of your comfort zone I think that's a really good way for people to like build up into doing into doing solo travel definitely I definitely agree and you know it, they're called shakeout trips so a motorcyclist would call it a shakeout trip so yeah. for instance I've always wanted to do the Appalachian Trail 
-hmm. So going to where you're really like your tent and everything on your back doing it. Where on the Camino, you don't have to have your camping gear. There actually isn't any camping right. officially in the north of Spain. So, so like for me, I was like, oh, like doing a Camino is kind of a shakeup trip for like the long distance walking and carrying a pack and yeah. stuff to build up to doing the Appalachian Trail. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I, but, yeah I think totally. just go with go with what you're comfortable with, or you know, even if you're traveling with. Um, your partner or with a friend just go have a day on your own if you're curious about it yeah. and traveling solo is very freeing I find but again like as much as I've done on my own or camping on my own it's also great when you have people at the end of the day to meet up with or those random encounters that you have I think it just leaves you more open to meeting more people and you also learn more about yourself too I can imagine now I'm sure things haven't always been perfect though. So we did a couple episodes not long ago. And so talk to us about maybe a travel fail that you've had. It all sounds, it all sounds like beautifully strange experiences you've had, but tell us about a travel fail. Oh my gosh. I'm sure I've had a bigger one, but it's actually kind of embarrassing <laughs> to talk about this because Tell us. I, I knew better, man. I knew better. We haven't we all? And so my significant other and I at the time were in Guatemala and we only had seven or eight days, which was a very shorter vacation time than we were used to. And Guatemala is, um, have either of you been to Guatemala? No. Okay. So you arrive in Antigua, the capital, but then it's like, all roads lead to Rome, all roads lead to Antigua. <laughs> and to get off to other roads, you have to go through Antigua. Oh. And I get, I was, I, I learned a lot that trip. They had done a lot of research and planned and made up a nice little itinerary. And I was like, no, let's just wing it. So like, mistake number one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I will forever eat that mistake. Um, <laughs> But it taught me, I learned from it. <laughs> um, and anyway, since we were short on time, we really wanted to hike a volcano. And there was Akatenango. I might have said it wrong, but Akatenango is the third highest peak. But again, we're short on time. We just spent two days at the beach. And again, keep I mention this because that's zero altitude, okay? Right. Get to Antigua, sleep spend the day, do a little hike to a volcano, which was very easy. And I think it was rated moderate. With a, okay, but now we got to do the big one and still hit everything else up with like three or four days left. Meanwhile, always coming back to Antigua. So you have to take a guided hike to do Akatenango. And it sits at about 13,000 feet when you're at the, at the peak. Mm -hmm. So 4,000 meters, give or take. Right. And it's about a kilometer and a half straight up from the little village that you start at. So you do need a guide and stuff. They recommend that you do it over two days. So you go up three quarters of the way, sleep at a little base camp, mm -hmm. adjust to the altitude, and then go up. But we're like, oh, it's rated difficult. Yesterday's was moderate. We'll be fine. We're fit. We're good. <laughs> But again, everything was kind of last minute, thanks to me. And we signed up as like the office was closing for this tour company. So we're like, yeah, we'll be here at five in the morning for you to take us up the mountain. Right. And then like there was no restaurants open, no shops or anything. There was just like corner stores with candy and crap. Right. So we bought some water, like two liters each, maybe six liters between us. And we had like these Oreo type cookies, Guatemalan Oreo. <laughs> and we thought, oh, there'll be something like a little bakery opening as we make our way back here, you know? No. <laughs> so we, show up at five in the we show up at five in the morning. We're sitting in Antigua waiting for the, the little van to come to take us up. <laughs> Eating some cookies into our stash already. And oh, it's just dreadful thinking about it. <laughs> and anyway, the van was late. I think it got there at 5:30. And 
we start up, we're going up the mountain, going through towns, da, 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 da. And then, because like, Guatemala is very volcanic and mountainous, <laughs> because the roads are so narrow, the van has to like pull over for these like transport trucks to get by. <laughs> Don't we sink down off the curb into the sand and get stuck? Oh, oh my gosh. No. Yeah. Oh, no. And again, you're supposed to start at the base of this volcano around seven. So you're not doing it in high noon. Right. Okay? right. So, so we're, we're stuck there for like a good hour. And then a Pepsi truck came and pulled us out, which was pretty epic. Yeah, thank you, Pepsi. We're like, oh yeah, that would be like beat Coke on any Super Bowl commercial. <laughs> <laughs> you save the gringos, Jing. <laughs> throw them a Pepsi. Yeah, and then we get to the bottom of the volcano and we start up and we're like, okay, we're here, we're good, we're going. Sure, it's 8.30, but we'll be fine. And yeah, so if you, have you hiked a volcano? <laughs> I've not hiked a volcano. No. 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 <laughs> Trust us, we haven't. It's yeah. like, Megan, it's like Franny times 20. Yeah, we've both done that. It's on Franny. So yeah. Okay. To... Yeah, Franny times 20, but put a no. lot of gravel in there the whole oh way. Oh, gosh. So um... for the first, I'd say like probably the col first kilometer up, it was just all gravel so you're like two steps forward one, one slide step back oh. <laughs> da, 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 da. so you exert a lot of energy at the start and you know water hot sun oh gosh like rookie rookie mistakes we should not have made mm. I should not have made so we did that then we kind of get to this like little shaded area but there's we're very low on water and also um, you have a tour guide he was prepared for himself but not that well but then what uh, in Guatemala they had at that time maybe they still do is the guide would have to take someone from the local village up as well so it's like one-to-one -one for people okay and it also gives some money to the local community and the kid he was like 18 in rubber boots <laughs> like he'd just come out of the barn and, and started up with us and yeah and he's doing this thing in rubber boots no water nothing oh my god and you can tell he's suffering so so we actually gave him like one of our spare oh. bottles of water so now we're we're sharing two liters which isn't two liters anymore oh my gosh oh it gets worse <laughs> ow <laughs> just very no and then so we're going up and then we hit this like little patch of what you'd expect a volcano to be like kind of lush and foresty and like hard mud paths we're like okay we're getting some ground right <laughs> now we go and then boom we're out in the sun and it's all up again Ooh. no gravel but at this point i also haven't mentioned how much altitude we're gaining Ooh, right <laughs> so we're starting to feel a bit sick a little headache Oh. And, you know, those internal thoughts you have when you're hiking at any time, it's kind of like, geez, why am I going slow? Why do I feel so weak? I know it's not just the water, like, you know, your body. Yeah. And I remember, like, the guide would be like, okay, okay, you're only 500 meters or so. We're like, okay, well, 500 meters is actually pretty long when you're feeling. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> would be. Yeah. Would be. <laughs> So anyway, everyone's hurting. Like even the guide who's done this like hundreds of times, even the kid who lives at the base of it in his rubber right. boots is, right. you know, but you're not going to complain because you're like, I'm not in rubber boots and at least I have some water like, and cookies, but. <laughs> you have those Guatemalan Oreos guys. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. oh my goodness. That's so, so funny. Growing up. Well, we're going up and we get there to the, the first caldera, but then there's another little one to go to. And the guide is like, you know what? We've got to be back down for the van in three hours because even though our time was cut short getting there, we still have to be back. Right. And he's like, let's just rest. And he's like, if you guys want to go up to the top, like one of us will go with you because they had to. Yeah. And my, my partner at the time, he's like, 
I'm about to lose my cookies. I'm tapping out. <laughs> yeah, literally, literally lose my cookies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And uh, he didn't, but, but I was like, I made it this far. I'm going up. <laughs> I'm not, like, right. man, ego check, cat, ego check. <laughs> So I, I went up and then the poor little guy in the rubber boots had to come with me and we went up and it was maybe another like 50, hundred meters up. Right. So I'm doing it and it's like, I've never had to stop like every 10 paces and rest. Wow. It was, it was the, al- cause I hadn't ever experienced altitude sickness right and known what that felt like or even done any research on it right. and I remember at one point like I could see like I was close to the top and I remember lying down flat being like is this worth a heart attack <laughs> because <laughs> my heart was like <laughs> oh. anyway I, I rested and then I kind of sat up and I was like I'm so close and I went right. and I finished and the, I think it was called Volcan Fuego. The, there was a volcano that was putting out smoke at the time we were there and you could see it. So I got there and I saw, I got the picture and didn't I turn around and the poor kid in the rubber boots who lives at the base of the mountain, he was throwing up. <laughs> I, just thought, I, I just thought like, oh my God, what have I done? You know, what have I done? anyway that poor, that poor kid oh my goodness yeah, i know cat the slave driver <laughs> get up the mountain yeah. oh, like i said this, this is embarrassing the story so anyway we we come down but then it, i can't remember exactly the time frame but i think it was probably like three and a half four and a half hours up mm-hmm. but we came down in about an hour and a half <laughs> because we had to make that van Man. so again think about going from this altitude oh, back down a kilometer and a half very quickly and we were <laughs> sliding in gravel and everything and oh my gosh and then you have to take a van back to Antigua and that's when it really really hit me where I was like about to hang out the van and traffic oh. and and it really messed up the trip for the next few days because your body just wasn't right. right. And all the dust. I didn't mention the dust. It was like my hair was so caked and matted in dust. We were we were brown. Like oh, I couldn't. My hair is pretty thin, but this is like a shishi poo poo. That's an ant word. She says shishi poo poo. Um, this is like a shishi poo poo moment I had traveling that kind of makes it all worth it. It's like, I was like, I am never going to wash this out myself. So I went this little, we were staying at a hostel and I went around the corner and there was a salon and they, they washed it out and they were like, oh, they're like, you wouldn't hike a volcano. <laughs> and then you came here yeah. for us to fix it. Oh, that is not yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they were like, "Fix me up," and they were like, "Don't come back." <laughs> <laughs> it's quite the yeah. Well, that's so it, it was. It was miserable. I've oh. never been. I've hiked across Spain, and that was easier than this damn volcano. <laughs> that sounds awful. That does sound Good awful. Freedom. Yeah. No. Anyways, it no, was. Um, yeah, a lot of lessons learned. So, like. Yeah, like I can't say I'm proud of it, but I learned a lot of lessons that I have not repeated. There you go. <laughs> That's good. That's you good. should learn something. That's so funny. Talk to us about working in a hostel. Meg and I have both never stayed in hostels. So yeah, tell us what it was like to to work in one. It was really incredible. Just such a formative experience at a time where you're I was in my early 20s, I was fresh at university, landed the gig, and I'm just forever grateful for the owner and his wife seeing something in me and having me there. And so this, it was a little hostel up on Cape Breton Island. It was one of the first ones there. I think it was the second or third officially. Yeah, yeah. It's under different ownership now and such, but I hear it's doing well, which is lovely. And uh, it was just great because you're also there when the hostel industry in Nova Scotia was just getting started and it was fairly unknown. And 
the people I got to meet through it, whether travelers or fellow workers in other hostels and stuff, and the friendships that last through till today, it's amazing. And it gave me a taste of what it's like to run your own business. And just so inspiring, like, again, going back to how we kind of opened here and you're like, you know, different experiences and different tastes of travel and that. And it's like, I got to meet so many people that were doing crazy things. And yeah. it, it was inspiring. Like some of my favorite guests, I remember to this day, like, there was this 80 year old woman from Switzerland. She Hi. just always wanted to go to Scotia rented a car and was going around the Cabot Trail and stayed with us for a few days. Aww. And I'll never forget Paul from Minnesota. He was in his like mid eighties. He comes up in this big pickup truck and he's got lovely like Midwestern accents. And, and he's just like, yeah, I'm just traveling around now. He's like, I keep a suit in the back and my kids know if I go, just put me in the suit and bury me where I ended. And it's just <laughs> like, wow. <laughs> Oh, Paul, bless oh, your heart. Paul, please don't die here. But like, yeah, no, not he here, was just, Paul. Not here. Yeah. Oh my God. No, but it was lovely. It was just such a, a really fun time too. I went to university in Halifax. So, you know, you've got the whole Halifax scene and university yeah. tends to take five years before. And it, it was really neat because I was really missing being out in nature and yeah. Yeah, I'm not a, I'm not, a, I enjoy a city exploring, but I'm not a city person. Yeah. And so, so yeah, you just get to meet a lot of different people. You get to learn how to interact with a lot of different people yeah. um, from different walks of life and learn a lot. You get to learn And a that lot. must be Listen really similar too, in regards to like, it's a perfect segue into like your Airbnb. So is that kind of like, was your inspiration to like open your own Airbnb or how did you get to that point? Like what made you decide to want to do that? The hostel definitely planted the seed. Let's say that. And when I left that life and moved on to other things, it was always in my back of my mind that I would love to have my, my own hostel one day. Airbnb by the time I left, was starting. It was not as well known. Coach surfing was kind of the big thing. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And then I I traveled through the states, and then I landed in Florida, and I coach surfed there. Like I was hosting coach surfers there, and also there's a, a bicycle network, and sort of like coach surfing, we can host cyclists. Yeah. So I, I do a little bit of that and got to meet some great people. Like, and then when I moved back to Canada, I continued the coach surfing thing. Mm-hmm. And then the first coach surfer was Jamie from Scotland, who I will hook you up with him and his <laughs> wife when you go, him and Sarah. And I mean, like, wow, what a friendship that's come from that. But it was always in the back of my mind. And then I think by the time I was back in Canada, it was like, yeah, I think like Airbnb would be more of a thing to do than the hostel and you have a little bit more of your own time and your own life, a little bit more separate, let's say. Doing the Caminos in Spain, I think the ultimate goal would be like to retire and run an albergue hostel for, for hikers on a Camino. Right. I think oh, that would be goal. amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that would just be so like soul nourishing to like give back to what you've yeah. experienced and the luck you've had so yeah to run the Airbnb I guess it's always just sort of been there and the opportunity and to be honest a lot of unfortunate things had to happen <laughs> to get back to Nova Scotia and and be here but you know it's it just seemed right to stay and the fact that we had the family property that we could share with others and yeah so that's I hope I answered the question well yeah (laughs) no definitely and I think like too you know in regards to the Airbnb so Jen's not been had the experience yet but she's going to go um (laughs) I've I think Peter and I have been there like three or four times at this point and yeah. I love it so much and there's a photo <laughs> album in there of like you know your pictures of building the chalet and your family and you really do get a sense that it's a, a, a family you know place where you've shared so much and now you are sharing it with other people which I think 
is a blessing. But the one thing I want to talk about that I know so well is that you put so many personal touches into that place for each guest that comes and stays. I'm sure you um, do the same. I'm sure it's not just me. Um, so, <laughs> but it really does. Make it fans, Megan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. It's just me. Um, so, but all those little things don't happen at every Airbnb. And it is what makes your, not only the family vibe, but the, what you do there. People don't know until they go, I guess. But once you've been, you're like, wow, that's above and beyond. So talk to us about how you come up like with your ideas and why those important or little touches are important to you because it doesn't happen everywhere. Okay. I can't see, honestly, I can't see doing it any other way because I think it would kind of go against my vision for for the experience so before starting Luna Rosa in 2019 I wrote down some core values of like why I'm doing it and I really come back to those I'll read them throughout the season I'll read them over the winter and just to always stay true to it when we decided as a family to start sharing it it it's, it's more about the experience than just a place to sleep mm -hmm. and I think as you guys as travelers like we're not just traveling to see things we're traveling to experience and yeah. I try and look at travel and staying at Luna Rosa as a sensual experience so it's what you're going to see what you're going to taste what you're going to smell what you're going to feel what you're going to I mean I don't have control over a lot of those elements but right. I try and just think about the simple life like I'm very into like a minimal life and like less is more and just how to kind of share that not 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 pressuring it on anybody just to slow down I think we all like no matter how busy your life is or complicated I just think we all need a safe space to escape to and that's I think what the world needs right now even before COVID like we just yeah. need to get away and unplug I only got a cell phone when I started Luna Rosa so <laughs> like the whole phone thing like being kind of attached to my phone from June through December is, is a whole new experience for me yeah. and I read I really see like how important unplugging is but yeah I, I just think it's it's about embracing the slow life and taking in nature and I guess my ideas just kind of come from nature and the senses and feeling and experience right. and and some past travel experiences too right that's yeah. beautiful <laughs> thank you yeah. it sounds like such What's a special place so it's been in your family for for a long time how did yeah did it um, I, I think it's 30 years this year that dad broke ground, actually. Oh, my goodness. I started to raise the rafters. Yeah, I think it's 30. So I have to look at the photo album, Megan, and uh, <laughs> check. But I'm pretty sure there's some 92 on those, on those photos, which wow. is probably dating myself as well. <laughs> was, was uh, but, um, yeah, no, they, mom and dad bought the land in 90, 90-ish. And yeah, part of the reason Luna Rose exists is because my family has a farm. So to go on vacations and travel was, wasn't, didn't happen. So to be able to get a little piece of land and a lake, and my parents are from Montreal and my dad and his brothers uh, would go with their family, usually in the summer to an uncle's cottage in Ontario. And I think dad just kind of wanted to recreate that experience for us all a little bit Aww. so most people went to church on Sundays and we finished chores and we all <laughs> hopped in the trucks and <laughs> went to the lake <laughs> and, oh, and a lot of memories there Aww. and uh yeah so it's yeah so my my parents bought the land my dad built it and I think some people sometimes walk in and think it was finished like five years ago <laughs> but it's well if you look at the countertop and the handles in the kitchen you know it's a little more 90s style right, right. Um, but, but I mean really that stuff might have been bought but it was never in place I mean I was done in a way and I think they kind of finished it all inside probably 
maybe 10 years ago ish oh yeah it's still it it looks fantastic like it's held up over the years like it's and it is the cleanest airbnb i've ever stayed in (laughs) we make jokes when we go because the wood is piled inside there's a there's a stove if you need to in the colder months build a fire and we like there's not even any like little sprigs of anything from the wood that's fallen on the floor. <laughs> I'm like, does she vacuum the wood? Like, I don't understand how this is even possible. And we're just like, oh, that's just Kat doing her thing. But it's, <laughs> it's pristine and it's perfect. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, geez. A lot of pressure now leading up to the season. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not worried about you at all. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Is there anything you want people to know about running an Airbnb that they might not realize just being on the, the booking side and of the running side? Yeah. There, there's a lot to it. And when I first started traveling, it, it took me a few times as a traveler to kind of catch on to the site and everything that's in there and in the listing and in the photos, like the photos have captions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did once I started hosting, but there's a lot of information in those photos. Yeah, I think the one thing to really hit home, and I can say this from chatting with quite a few other hosts, is that it, it's our homes. It's it's something in the family. Yeah. You know, there's there's a lot of people that are building their tiny home dream, or they're putting up a yurt dream or a dome because it's something they've always dreamed of doing, or a cottage, and, and sharing it with the world. And I think. Just don't ever forget that it's someone's home. And I think as the platform grows and the guest base grows, things can start to get treated a little bit more like a hotel, let's say. Right, right. No one should ever leave a hotel disastrous. Let's just say that, but (laughs) there's no excuse. Right. I think that there's times where like there's so much newness to Airbnb that people are treating it more like an Expedia website to book a hotel and not realizing that it's someone's home and property and a lot of love goes goes into them a lot of love yeah and everyone's unique right so you there's the whole rating system with Airbnb and I that's a little controversial with a lot of people hosts and guests alike because every Airbnb is unique. That's what Airbnb is based on, unique homestays. So you can't really compare apples to oranges. Right. So, sure. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, but it's, there's people's homes in there. Yeah. Yeah. They're fun. They're fun. So yeah. What would you guys look for in an Airbnb when you go like, Go, Jen, you say. I don't know. Airbnb. I honestly, like, we haven't done a lot of Airbnbs. I had, a, like, a not great experience the first time we stayed in one in a condo in Toronto. And it's, like, it had put me off of it for a long time. Yeah. But I think treating them as, what I would use it for now is a unique stay. Like, I, yeah. when we stayed in Toronto, we were just looking for somewhere to stay and it really didn't matter. But we, we did have a bad experience. But the now when I'm looking for somewhere like we have one booked for Isle of Skye and then another one booked for Fort William and so we were looking for a location but also we were looking for a bigger space because we're we're doing a little bit of group travel in Scotland as well so having a space where we can all be together and kind of like sharing that experience and having a kitchen and like that sort of thing is definitely that's amazing yeah. yeah I think for me, it's either unique experience, like staying in an old church or, you know, like something like that, or the other one for me is unplugging. So I'm either looking for like one or the other. So something different if I see, and, and everybody is different, but for me personally, if it's just someone's house in a residential neighborhood, that's not what I'm ever looking for unless I just need somewhere to stay. So for me, if I am booking something like that, it's definitely for the unique piece of it, or like I said, just to get away from it all. So that's usually sort of what I'm looking for. Yeah. There's so many gems in Nova Scotia. Like there are yeah. time or two where I can get away especially the last few years you know yeah it's Nova Scotia and it's just like it's just everything's so unique and wonderful and yeah creative yeah <laughs> yeah 
it's kind of funny. It's like, you know, people like to look into other people's homes and it's just kind of like getting yeah. in the door. <laughs> like, but yeah, yeah it's, it's true. Is, we're travel all, curiosity. <laughs> we're yeah. all a little nosy. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what makes us travelers. Exactly. <laughs> that is we're so curious. True. We're curious. We're curious. That's a good way to put it. Instead of <laughs> Oh my gosh, this has just like filled my heart so much. I love talking. To you all. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kat, for coming on and and telling telling your travel stories and and sharing your insights. It's been it's been really really lovely. Thank um, you. It's been a new experience for me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, Megan, I'm I- not a good public speaker, so I'm sure you'll have lots of edits. Whatever. Oh. No big deal. Um, Thank you everyone for listening to this episode. As always, if you enjoyed the show, you could leave us a review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. You can chat with us on Facebook or Instagram and share the show with a travel loving pal. And we will talk to you soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.